Welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight for um, what I think is going to be a really interesting evening and um, our second in one-on-one -on -one interviews and I promise the next one will not have someone named Nina. <laughs> There's a little bit of a pattern that did develop and uh, I think I've run out of the Nina part so I have to search high and low. Um, but we are really honored to have Nina Jacobson here tonight uh, who has had a pretty extraordinary 20-year career so far in the film industry, and I could stop there because 20 years in the film industry is achievement enough, but more amazing since 2008 has produced Hunger Games, <laughs> I like to say, Hunger Games, but blockbuster movie, Diary of a Would-Be Kid, she's very popular in my house, I have three young yeah. girls, and there's a, movies that play on loops, those are two of them, um, and the, the next Hunger Games comes out in November. And before that was at Walt Disney, president of Walt Disney Motion Pictures, and did a couple of independent movies, one called Pirates of the Caribbean, um, Narnia, <laughs> Princess Diaries, um, and we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you. And who has also been a friend of the Federation for a long time, his family's been a friend of the Federation for a long time, and that would be more than so thank you for coming. And interviewing tonight, again, back for a repeat performance, is Daniel Barron, who writes the Hollywood Jew blog for the Jewish Federation, which was named Best Blog by Los Angeles Press Club. Yes. Got it right. Jewish Journal, by Jewish the way. Jewish Journal. I said Jewish Journal, didn't I? Not for average. Like, the yeah. Jews are all the same. It's They're all the same. <laughs> yeah, it's true. They're all the same everywhere. Um, and is, has interviewed numerous luminaries in the entertainment business, and we thrilled to have her be regular for this program, and I'm going to bring her up now, and thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you for coming. Good. Can, can everyone hear? If we don't use the mics, can you hear us? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. It's an intimate gathering. We'll be fine. So, Nina, thank you for being here. Welcome, everyone, uh, or anyone who's repeating, and this is your second salon, as it is for some of us. Welcome back. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, I admit that I did not know much about you until today, but I spent a lot of time Google searching you this afternoon. And the first thing, I always like to start with childhood, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is, what was your childhood dream? Um, I wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> so that didn't really work out. Did <laughs> you have a lot of animals? Um, well, I would like to have more, but right now I've been limited to just my dog and my horse. <laughs> and I understand your mother is here this evening, which yes. is very nice. So I know you grew up in Los Angeles, but I don't know much more than that. So tell us a little bit, give us the movie pitch of your childhood narrative. It's not all that exciting, really. Uh, we grew up in, 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 I grew up in Brentwood. My, uh, I live five minutes from my mom now, and five minutes from my brother on the other side. And growing up, we lived five minutes from my grandparents on both sides, and we just always been um, an L.A. family with a lot of extended family nearby. Um, you know, my son, my, my brother's kids and my kids are very close. And we just, you know, we when I grew up in L.A., when I went to Pally High, I went to Paul Revere, you know, you can grow up in L.A. and not really know movie business people. The only person I knew in the movie business was an old friend of my dad, Dick Sherman, who with his brother wrote all the great Disney classics, you know, the music for all the great Disney classics. But other than that, you know, I really didn't have much exposure to the movie business. I didn't have any idea that I would end up doing this. I was much more of a very academic kid. And Actually, I think there's someone here tonight who went to high school with you and said that they remember you as president of the student council. Um, I was involved in student council. <laughs> I don't think I was ever president of the student council. I he think said, I was, he said you were very serious. I was, I was serious. I was very, very serious. Focused. I was very, very, you know, nerdy, really, pretty nerdy. So something I always like to ask people is, what would you say is the, what, what value did you inherit from your mother, and what value did you inherit from your father? What was sort of like the central lesson that you got from each parent? Um, I would say from my mom, um, kindness and um, resilience and flexibility. And from my dad, um, you know, drive and ambition and, uh, you know, 
confidence that if you want something and you work hard for it, that you um, can have it. And when I was, when I graduated from college, by then I knew I wanted to go into the entertainment business, but I had no real idea how to do it. And my dad said, well, he was an early adopter of technology. And so he said, well, there's this new word processing program I have. And with my dot matrix printer, if you give me a creative directory, and we'll say, you know, dear blank, you know, I've always wanted a job in blank. We could send out like thousands of letters that way, you know. And I was like, that's never, ever gonna work. Like that's like the least likely thing that will ever work. And but my dad was like a big believer. Like, okay, you know what you want to do now. If you put, you know, like the sweat equity into it, you'll get to do it. And I really was humoring him and sending out the letters because he, you know, financed my college education. It seemed like would be bad sportsmanship. <laughs> Let him have the little thing with the word processing thing and the program, the dot matrix printer, and pulling the little strips off the side and all that. And then, like, I got a ton of phone calls from the form letters, you know, because people didn't really know they were form letters back then. We were really able to pull the wool over people's eyes, and they really thought that I'd written a letter just to them. And um, I was able to get a lot of phone calls, and then one phone call, you'd have a meeting, and then they'd introduce you to somebody else. And, you know, they actually, those letters helped open a lot of doors for me. They were, they were just happy to hear from you, not through Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, how would you characterize your Jewish upbringing? Um, well, my, um, my grandfather, who was really like my mom's dad, who was really like the patriarch of our family, his um, mother was Orthodox, and although he and my grandmother were Reform, they, our synagogue, he was one of the you know early members of University Synagogue, and he was president of University Synagogue, and our synagogue was a big part of our life. And I went to religious school and had my bat mitzvah, and my Jewish identity, I would say, was a big part of growing up, and a big part of what uh, how I saw myself was, you know, that I had my secular life and I had my Jewish life. And it was one of the things about going to a public school and then going to a local temple was that you had a big overlap. So you had a lot of kids that you knew both from school and from temple. And, um, you know, there are people in that group who I'm still friends with or who are parents in my elementary school or my, you know, the school that my kids go to now. And um, so I think, you know, even though we were not hugely observant, we were observant enough that it was a big part of my identity. What do you think made the difference between feeling sort of endeared to Judaism and not turned off it? Because I think there was a whole generation of American Jews that was really turned off to Hebrew school. It was not satisfying, they didn't find it meaningful, they were bored, it was something they didn't want to do. So like, what made the difference in your life that it actually felt like something that you confected to? Well, I think partly it was um, the fact that there was overlap, that we, a lot, there was a group of friends that we all went to school together and to religious school together. And actually part of the reason why we ended up changing synagogues was because I wanted my kids to have that experience. I didn't want them to feel like, Religious school was a thing you had to do that you didn't know anybody there other than the kids you went to religious school with, but that there was a connection between their secular lives and their religious life. And um, so I think that was um, a big, a big part of feeling proud of being Jewish. And then I think my grandfather was just a very, very important and powerful figure in our lives, and I admired him. Enormously, and I um, and we had the you know kind of enmeshed Jewish family that was very connected. Most of the friends I knew didn't have the closeness with their grandparents, their great grandparents. And by closeness, we mean no secrets. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I was thinking about that recently. How like if I had ever wanted to go like into espionage or something like how difficult it would be yeah. because you know I would just say to my mom like oh you know I was out. Well, where were you? You know, I was stuck there. Well, who were you with? Well, what were you wearing? <laughs> what, were you wearing? Where, what did you eat? You know, and, and we told everyone at the sister right, would be there right, last right. You would never be able to have any. Right. Well, I was out of the country. Like, you would never say, I was out of the country. 
Um, and um, like that, that, that would never work. I don't know how. I bet you there are not actually a lot of Jewish spies <laughs> in Israel where there's like more tolerance for that. But um, so uh, so but, you so you went to so you went to Brown. Yes. I, so you before the form letters went to Brown. So I want to know what you studied, and then tell me how did you come? You said you figured out what you wanted to do. How did you come to that decision? Like why Hollywood of all things? Um, well, I didn't exactly know that I wanted to go into Hollywood per se. I ended up at Brown, you know, you could sort of choose your courses. You didn't have to take a set curriculum. So I started to take film theory classes that were, at the time, they were called semiotics, which was the program. It was like a theoretical introduction to, it was like a critical studies. And it was a way of looking at, you could look at literature, you could look at pop culture. You could look at film this way, and I got really, I got very caught up in it and very intellectually engaged by it. It was something that the more I studied it, the more questions I had, the more curious I became, the more interested I was. And so I started watching a lot of movies and studying movies, and the more movies I watched, the more enthralled I became and the more curious I became. And it just became like the most interesting thing I'd ever come across. I'd never found something that never bored me and never... Um, I never ran out of questions, and I never ran out of curiosity, and I never felt like, it wasn't like a, um, a well you could fill, it was more like a fire you could build. And um, so from that I actually, but I also, there's a very like leftist bent to a lot of semiotic theory, um, because it sort of incorporates Marxist theory and feminist theory and psychoanalytic theory, it was very, very, cerebral, not practical, remotely, not even a little bit practical. And yet, so I thought I wanted to go to documentaries and make sort of, you know, politically relevant documentaries. That's what I thought I wanted to do coming out of college. And right, so I, so I know when your first job you were a documentary researcher. So that's what I was doing in pursuit of that goal. And then when I sort of realized that most of the people who would ever see a documentary you would make would already think what you thought. <laughs> 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 a little bit of fun out of it for me. And also that whoever was financing it would also have a lot of say over what you could say, or what was the emphasis of what you were saying. And so I became more interested in the idea of populist storytelling and of being able to tell us to make up stuff, being able to make up stories. And people by surprise. Yes, and being able to um, still impact the way people, you know, saw things, but in more of an incremental way based on an emotional engagement with characters and based on entertainment as opposed to pedagogy. So one of my favorite stories, and I don't know how many of you will know this, but this is amazing. So I found an article in the New York Times archive from 1993. So. Nina was a documentary researcher, and then she like was a story analyst at Disney for a bit, and then she got an early gig with the producer Joel Silver. And apparently, during their first meeting, she decided to let him know that she had heard that he had a reputation for not being a mensch. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, he loved this and hired her. So, um, first of all, that's like the greatest quote ever in the New York Times. And secondly, where did this like chutzpah come from? Yeah. Well, so I had had this very, very strange thing where for, I had worked for first in documentaries, then I had done become like a script reader, and I'd been a script reader at the Disney Sunday movie for about six months when the writer's strike in 1988 hit, and I lost my job. It was my first full-time job where I had like regular, you know, reliable work, and I was really crushed, and the only person who was hiring during, so then also you couldn't get work, and the only person who was hiring was Joel, who didn't seem to be bothered by the writer's <laughs> <laughs> strike, and so um, I was able through, like, again, a really remote connection. The, one of the first people who helped me out was Lauren Chula Donner, who was somebody, again, my dad, never wondered to take no for an answer, had through the most remote connection that like, he knew somebody who knew her brother-in-law. It was like a really not very strong connection. <laughs> Got her name for me. And she always sort of looked out for me, and the people in her office always looked out for me. So they told me, he's across the way from us at Warner's, they're hiring, and the assistants in her office let me know. And I was able to do a set of notes and get in to 
finally make it to the finals, of being one of like the three people he was going to meet. And on the night that I interviewed, I got there and the waiting room was packed with strippers who he was personally interviewing for the role of stripper. <laughs> uh, Oh and my God. I was like sandwiched between a bunch of strippers, and they all looked at me. Yes, that was, he wasn't there. Um, it was just the strippers and me. And um, they all were looking at me like I had gotten really bad guidance from my. <laughs> yeah, they were embarrassed for me. And um, so finally I got called in, and he started the interview with So, what have you heard about me? So he was asking for it. I mean, I was like, well, I was like, oh, you're the greatest guy ever. You know, so I just said what I heard about him. And he really liked it. And he, uh, he liked getting, uh, he said, you know, that's why I love Jews with glasses. And I hired him. <laughs> so did that, like, come from a place of, like, confidence or, like, balls? Which it was, was just sort of like an impulse move. It was just sort of, like, you don't. You know, and I always, after I worked for him, I always noticed that he was yelling at somebody on the phone and like just chewing a person, just chewing them out and just being so outrageous. And but he had a big smile on his face. He liked the persona. He right. liked being, you know, the enfant terrible. He liked the whole thing. And so I, I guess I must have known that he actually took a certain pride in being an asshole. Ultimately, <laughs> <laughs> a compliment. So my other favorite thing in this awesome 1993 article was that you were described as, quote, a powerful punker. And apparently, when she got her first, like, executive job at Universal, she had to go out and buy three fancy suits, heels, and a handbag, because ordinarily, she'd be wearing leather and four earrings. So how, where does this come from, and, and, and where did it go? Well, I still am it's wearing a leather and four earrings. <laughs> so I've just gone back to that. Um, no, my grandmother um, always used to say, you know, I have a vision of you in like a beautiful suit. And I was like, well, that's just not really accurate. I got a wrong, that's just going to be one of those wrong premonitions, you know. And, um, and but when I became an executive back in the day, that was really like the uniform. And, you know, so I had to go out and, buy suits and get hers and get like more ladyish shoes. And um, then as soon as they became a producer, I immediately got rid of all of those things and gone back to, you know, more, more, more to the punk aesthetic. Yeah, well, these, well, it's a more of a grown up version of it because you know, now I'm old and that would really be kind of more <laughs> really, you know. What is that about? Like, what is that? What does it say to you? <clears throat> or what does it say about you? You know, you just you develop whatever it is that you feel like in your shoes or you know uncomfortable, and like that makes you feel like you're not pretending to be somebody else. And actually, I enjoyed the suit years. I enjoyed the suit years. You know, um, I I enjoyed the suit years. It was fun to have a, like a, a bit of like a uniform, like an armor. You know. Um, but uh, and but at the same time, I would really was as soon as the suit years were over, I was couldn't wait to actually go back into the booths. Yeah, get back to the booths. But now it drives my mom crazy because basically all of my wardrobe choices are based on whether or not I'll be able to wear the motorcycle boots. With it. <laughs> <laughs> so you were considered very much a young prodigy. You 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 got. You got very high up in the industry very quickly. For example, like when this article was written, I think you were 27. Um, did you did you have like when you set out in the industry? Did you know what you wanted to accomplish? Did you had sort of did you have like a grand plan, or did you sort of go with the flow? Um, I think that I got the the when I got to my first executive job at Universal it was actually the time that I first fell. Like, I love that job. You know, I worked for producers, and I liked that. I enjoyed the reading scripts, and like always for me, it came down to having a really loving to read, and then having a point of view about what I'd read. And that's still, for me, always been the backbone and the, the fundamental thing that I still love to do, and that always was the, uh, was the core of everything for me. But then to go from, you know, production companies that do, you know, a 
couple of things at a time at best. Um, to a studio where, you know, studios making, especially back then, 20, 25 movies a year. They are all in different stages, and some you're working on scripts and development, and sometimes you're working on a movie that's casting, and sometimes you're working on a movie that's shooting and one that's in post. I loved the volume. I loved the action. I loved the pace and the energy, and I felt completely at home, even with, like, the sartorial... Uh, you know, <laughs> shift. Um, once I got the thing where you had to wear the suit, um, I loved it. I loved that pace. And I felt, once I started doing that, and I saw that the boss was the person who got to decide on the movies that were being made, then I really wanted to work my way up to being in that role. And so I kind of set a course at that point. But then, ironically, by the time I had gone to Disney, I actually went to Disney having then adjusted my goal because I was building my family at that time. And I went to Disney knowing that the guy who was Four running years. the joint, I went to Disney in 98. And at that point, my son, my first son had just, was born in 98. And I went there knowing that this was sort of another phase and that there was a, um, there's an executive who's now producer named Lucy Fisher. And she became my role model because she, was raising children and worked three days a week, but was great at what she did, and she just worked on her movies, was incredibly well respected, but had the belief that like three really good days from her were as valuable as five days from somebody else, and that those other two days could be spent with her family. And I'm sure it was ended up being more than three days, and then, like the job always is bigger than you want it to be. But I then was like, I want to be her. I'll be the second in command to this guy who's been here forever, and I'll just sort of fly under the radar, work on my movies, let him be the one who has the power, and I'll just be the one to work on my movies. And um, as soon as I didn't want the job anymore, was when then he got fired, and then I ended up with the job. So. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk to you about that there seems to be like an incredible cultural interest, particularly at this moment, in how powerful, successful, busy <coughs> women maintain a work-life balance. So, you know, how important was that mentorship, the ability to see someone else and maybe model, and how, how were you able to do it? I mean, what was, what was the way you sort of said about crafting your own life in that image? Um, well, I was... In a way, it turned out very fortuitously because by the time I had the job, I actually, at the time at which my first, when my boss got fired, um, I had the job with Park, and I was very happy with that. I've always been a big, uh, really had an appreciation that partnership is a great way to balance your work and your family, is to have somebody else you can count on besides yourself. and to be less concerned with having the most power and more concerned with having the balance. And that less power in work might equate more power in life. And um, so at first I had a partner, and then while I was newly pregnant with our second child, which is the child that I carry, um, I was when my boss, Joe Roth at that time, and then my partner, he left, Joe, and my partner left with him. Mm. And um, I was begging, don't go, don't go, but I couldn't say why because I was very newly pregnant. And so then I actually ended up having the job by myself at exactly the time that I was pregnant. The worst possible the moment. Really not <laughs> optimal timing. Right. But at that point, I told my bosses, like I, I told them before you let me have the job by myself, like you should know that I'm pregnant and they were, you know, good sports about it because it would have been very bad form to be like, oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but by then I had enough um, influence over my own world that I was able to have a proper maternity leave. I took my time off and I had the staff meetings at my house for the three months of my maternity leave. Uh, my daughter also was nice enough to be born in the fall, so it was kind of going into Thanksgiving and Christmas. And uh, so it was like actually good timing, and I'm like it was a little bit quieter. But I had the meetings at my house. I set up a nursery opposite my office. Things that I really couldn't have done 
at any other time without, even though it seemed it was very hard to have the mo most responsibility at, the, at home and at work all at the same time, having earned the place that, at the table made it so that I could actually much more shape my day and my, you know, have a nanny bring, the, you know, my daughter to me so that I could keep nursing. And I really was actually able to set the terms in a way that working my way up, I never could have set the terms. It's amazing that you say that because I think Cheryl Sandberg says the same thing in her book, like get to get get as high as you can and then you'll be able to sort of write your own ticket. Yeah, and I was very fortunate that I was able, and people just sort of knew, like, don't call me at home like, unless your pants are on fire, but otherwise, like, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Like, it's not, if we're not curing cancer, it's not going to change. You know, and some things really urgent, then call me at home, and obviously, we'll deal with it. But most things, they're not critical things that are happening at 8 o'clock at night at your office, but there are critical things that are happening at your house at 8 o'clock at night. So do you feel like you had to make any sacrifices in your work life to be better at family life? And or and or do you feel like what were the sacrifices you had to make in family life to be better in your work life? Well, I mean, I've been very, um, very fortunate because my partner made the choice to be an at-home mom, and it's been an incredible gift for my children and for me, and it's made things possible for me that I don't know how I would have juggled it if I if we were two working parents. Um, and at the same time, I do think that. Um, you know, I I actually was and probably still am less ambitious than I actually otherwise would be about work. I mean, I'm ambitious, but there's I made I, the advice I always give people who come to me for advice is like to be ambitious about your whole life and don't just be ambitious about your job because it's only one part of your life. And particularly, I know better than most that like. Jobs come and go. They, you get fired or whatever. Things happen, and that the job won't always be there. And if you forfeited your the rest of your life to have the job, when the job goes away, then what really what do you have that matters to you? And so, even though I've been fortunate to have, you know, in some ways, sort of a lot of my ascent was. Literally, just people dropping like flies around <laughs> from an early <laughs> stage. It right? did. I mean, really, a lot of times I got promoted because somebody else got fired, and I was just doing my work, and somebody would get fired, and I would get promoted. And it wasn't. It wasn't. Well, uh, you know, I I haven't. I, I often will look at any choice, especially now as a producer. There are things that. You know, I have to ask myself, would I, if I produce this, would it be worth it to be away from my family? And even if it might be lucrative or it might be worthwhile for other reasons, if I don't love it enough or feel moved enough by it that I think it's worth to be away from my family, mm -hmm. I'll just choose not to do it. And so I will probably be, there's a version of my life in which I think I would be more ambitious and more driven and more have a bigger body of work. It's interesting, though, because the way it sounds, it, it sounds as if maybe you're a better producer because you have this other life that pulls you, so you're a little more particular about what you go for. Yeah. Um, so actually, that reminds me of something. So you, I read an interview where you talked about pitch meetings as a dog and pony show, and you said that unless, I think it was the time you were at DreamWorks, and you said unless something like totally, you know, blows you away, you know, maybe every six to eight weeks you'll pick something up. Which so happen now, six to eight weeks. <laughs> now right, it would be a dream, right? Um, yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, like, what kind of stories really? to you. So you said, you know, you're, you love reading, you're a voracious reader, and you love having an opinion about things, but what are the kinds of stories that, that you find move you again and again? Is there any kind of thing that they share? And, and secondly, while you're thinking about that, I wonder, do you feel as a producer, as someone who's creating content that's seen all over the world, especially with something like The Hunger Games, that's so hugely popular worldwide, um, do you consider any kind of mission in, in the content that you invest in, or is it just stories well told and entertainment? Um, well, for me, 
I find that the, the common thread is the page turner. And I just, the thing that you can't put down, the thing that you can't stop thinking about, the thing that just sticks, it just, it's a very intuitive, non-scientific thing. But um, it's like, I'm obsessed with Game of Thrones right now. And to me, Game of Thrones is like a case of, you know, these guys have us gathered around the fire, and like nobody's getting up, you know? And nobody is getting up, and you can't wait for them to start talking again, you know, to hear more of their story. They, it is that very basic storytelling instinct. And a story well told is the thing that, and for me, I think what, generally is the common thread in those stories is that for me at least that they're they're based in character that they are character premises it's a character that i care about and i the thing i find is that at any given time i ask if there's either something i want or something i dread for the characters i'm i'm in and if i neither want nor dread anything i'm out and any story in which they can hold me in with want and with dread the whole time, or that I think that with the right shaping, the story could hold you in with want and with dread. But all of those things are rooted in caring about the characters. If you don't care about them, you neither want nor dread what might happen to them. Um, and so beyond that, there aren't really, there's any number of genres and whatnot that I would gravitate to. I've ended up, as far as mission, I do think I, I, still have the wish for social change. And deeply buried in almost everything that I've worked on is something thematically that I actually think is worth sharing. And it could be a very seemingly frivolous, silly movie. Um, there was a movie I did at Disney that you should watch recently with my kids again, called Game Plan, which is like with The Rock, and it's a very silly movie. And yet, when we were working on it, what I was interested in was the idea of um, what makes a parent, and that what for this that frequently men I knew who were raising children without a mom, one, two gay men, whatever, people would say, "Oh, I feel so sorry for that child that there's no mother in it, in his or her life," you know. And there's this expectation that men are not as capable. Um, or as qualified to parent as women are. And so deep underneath a very goofy, you know, program of a movie is actually between the writer, um, my friend Audrey Wells, who did most of the rewriting on it, and myself, was an interest in what makes a parent and can we actually tell a story about a um, person who doesn't seem like they're cut out to be a parent, but actually what has what it takes, or learns to have what it takes to be a parent, um, despite not having the obvious trappings of what a parent might, we think a parent looks like. Um, and so there are those things, and certainly the reason why Hunger Games is so immensely gratifying for me is that it's about a girl who uh, doesn't see herself as a hero, who doesn't see herself as a revolutionary, but who becomes a revolutionary and changes the world. I'm so glad you said that because it's the perfect segue into my next question, which is, so you've had this incredible career, you've been a top executive at like almost every major studio that there is. Um, and I think actually Forbes, um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but Forbes uh, named Nina one of the most powerful women in the world in 2005. You were right around with like the politicians. I was like, like in the 70s or something. Um, <laughs> um, so, how do you, what's inside of you? What does it take to have that kind of success and, and achieve that level of prominence and still retain a semblance of humility and not turn into a tyrant? And, and I ask that because I think it's a challenge to every human being who achieves power. Power is a, is, a, is a delicate and can be dangerous thing. How do you sort of, how do you navigate um, once you're in that world and sort of maintain who you are inside um, when, you, when you have the ability to do what you want? 
Um, well, I there were two people who said two very influential things to me about both of, about that. Um, one was um, that um, early on, really long before it was even relevant, I had lunch when I was a young executive with a very senior agent at the time, Jack Rapke, and he was like at the top of the ladder, and I was down at the bottom of the ladder. We had um, lunch at La Conda Veneta, and he said this thing to me that really stuck with me and that I always remembered, and it turned out to be really true, which was that you know power is a paradox, and that those who truly have it hardly ever exercise it. Because as soon as you're forced to exercise it, you have less of it. And that um, power is about restraint, and that ultimately um, to be, that to really be powerful is actually to still do the work to convince people on the merits of your argument, and not to just impose your will. First of all, because at least half the time in any conversation where you disagree with somebody, there's just as much of a chance that they're right and you're wrong. So being able to not assume that you're right because you have the power, but to actually let it be a free market economy. It's the opposite of Game of Thrones. Yes, it's not. <laughs> you know, you um, it's sort of like you listen or you die. Right. Um, and that, um, that if you let it be a free market economy of good ideas, that you actually just let it be the best idea, the better idea to, that emerges, let the movie be the thing that has the power and not you, that that is really the source of your power. And so as an executive, we had, you know, you, the studio usually has um, final cut on most movies. And I never used it. I never felt that any argument that you would win by imposing your will was an, based on what he had said. I really thought that was true. It was really an argument you had lost. Um, because if you couldn't win the person over, then maybe it wasn't worth winning it that over. And, um, Don't tell Harvey Weinstein. I know. I just was a different um, <laughs> worldview, but it really stuck with me. And then the other thing was something that um, Jerry Bruckheimer said to me, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which was when I first got my job as at Disney, which is there are two kinds of people in your job, the ones who think they'll have it forever or the ones who know they won't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, also very true, like, you get the job, they get out the egg timer, you're going to, like, sooner or later, the bell will toll for thee. And that's an amazing attitude to have, because I imagine, like, especially being in this business, and I know you've been through, you know, everybody has career ups and downs, but in Hollywood, it's like, you have the, these ridiculous ups and downs, plus, like, everyone's, you're in a fishbowl, because everyone's looking at you, not only within the industry, which is very small and tight, and everyone knows each other, but you have the you know, the eyes of the world on you in a lot of ways. So like, what what sustains you? How do you not, how do you not fall apart when you lose your job somewhere, especially after you come to sort of understand yourself as someone who's who's important, you know, and accomplished? Well, I mean, I think that's that's weird, having having something better to do. So having something else and other things that matter to you is really important. If you think that your job is your life, you lose your job, and then who are you? It's not that you don't, actually. I mean, when I got fired from Disney, I did have an enormous amount of, like, you know, long nights of, of worrying that I would not ever... Work again. Yeah, I would never <laughs> find a job that I love that much, and I would never have that kind of success again, and that it was a product of good mm -hmm. luck and circumstance of being in a great company, and that... Um, and so it's not that you don't get your self-esteem caught up in your job. It's hard not to. But having a family and having, you know, both my my parents and my brother and my, you know, grandparents and my children and having an identity that was not going to be changed by what job I had um, was a very, very important to me and I think really helped me to get through that period of uncertainty. So unfortunately I got the I got our, our, our time warning from Janet already. So I want to ask you two last things before we open up for an audience QA. Um, so I wanted just to ask you one thing about Israel because I know I understand you went for the first time like in 2007 with David Law or no you had been there as a kid, but you went for the first time as an adult. 
um, on a trip with uh, David Lawner, who at the time was a William Morris agent, and um, he took a bunch of Hollywood people to Israel. Um, and um, I want to read you a quote that you gave to the Jewish Journal in, in just after you got back from that trip, and then I'm going to ask you what's changed for you since then. But so. She returned from Israel and she said, as an American Jew and a liberal person, I had more mixed feelings about Israel before I went. If you follow the images in the news, what you tend to see is a lot of images of armed Israelis and wounded Palestinians. If you are a liberal person, it's hard to make peace with that. And frequently, when you talk to a lot of American Jews, they're so defensive of Israel, you can't have a sophisticated discussion. What I found amazing is that in Israel, People are having that discussion every day, and they're not defensive of the complexity of their daily lives. So that's like, first of all, it's a brilliant quote, because I think it totally captured like the zeitgeist of the kind of American-Jewish-Israel-Hollywood relationship at that time. But amazingly, there has been this like resurgence in Hollywood interest, investment, business, travel, to Israel since then. I mean, this whole crazy thing has happened where now everybody's going and there's all this business going on. So can you feel that? Like, what changed for you personally after that trip? And can you feel the difference of the past five years in terms of the Hollywood relationship to Israel? Do you, does it feel different to you today, tomorrow, the conversations, the sense of friendliness towards it or interest or care? versus back in 2007? Well, I mean, I, I believe, I think a lot have the, I think that there's been great change affected by the work the Federation has done in sending people. I think it is, uh, it is a small community. People do talk to each other. You go on the trip, you come back, you're all energized by the trip. I had great people on the trip with me. We all came back greatly impacted, really moved, and then the next, I mean, there were always great people who wanted to go on the trip, and then they come back, and then somebody else would go on the trip, and then, you know, what, it was just like a year or two ago, that great group of women all went. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that those trips, that there's an exponential impact because of the fact that it is a small community, and so everybody would come back from their trip having a similar experience, I think, of seeing things through new eyes, and then talking about it and sharing it, and then and somebody else will go on the trip. And so I do think some of it is just a really effective program. I think what you know, the Federation has done an incredibly effective program in changing perspectives. But then the other side of it is that we're just a bunch of opportunists. And so a lot of great creative product has come from it. And everybody's just looking for a story that they want to tell. Everybody's like, well, I, I want it to. I wish I were doing that, man. I should be going to Israel. Like, we're a bunch of opportunists. We all just want to find another great story. And so if all of a sudden there's a, if there are great stories there, um, then, you know, we, then all of a sudden everybody wants to go there. And everybody wants to see what's coming out of there and the television formats from Israel that have caught, you know, on here have, I think, opened a lot of doors because now there's this sort of creative back and forth, and a realization that whereas frequently there is not a universal language of cinema, you can't just plop storytelling from one culture to the next, there's sort of a surprising porousness between Israel and Hollywood in terms of things that have worked. More things have worked coming from Israel than from many other places, and so I think that's had an impact as well. A lot of shared kind of cultural values and sensibilities. Uh, so the last thing I want to ask you before we go to the Q&A is um, something that really struck me that Nina Tassler actually said during our interview here, um, and, I, and I'll quote her, but she said, you know, after all the success and um, this amazing family life and passions and, you know, feeling connected to the Jewish community and all the sort of, like, wonderful things that make her feel her existence is whole, she said, you know, we're at this place in life right now where we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. So I imagine that you're someone who can relate to that, if, if, if probably we all can on some level. Um, what are you afraid of? What keeps you up at night? What do you worry about? Well, everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you're Jewish. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, I, I mean, for one, you know, my, I lost my dad in August, and you very aware as you get older that 
uh, you know, when you're young, you go through the phase where everybody is having their bar bat mitzvahs, and you know, a bit older, everybody's going to college, and they're all getting married, then they're all having kids, and a lot of people are getting divorced, and then we move into this next phase, which is really, you know, a lot of loss wounds, and you're know, very aware of that, and aware of. Um, in some ways, you become aware of which my grandfather was always also a big believer in, which is like, you know, if, if you, if there's any chance that you can be happy, you really should be, because there'll be days that you can't be, and so all the days that you could have been that you weren't were wasted. You got a lot of good advice along your life journey. I have to say, I like could write down all of these like a lot of. Actually, I remember it's interesting you said because I remember I asked uh, Sherry Lansing when I was doing a profile of her. What was the hardest part about getting older? And she said, losing people that you love. Yeah. And so, so that's a big thing. And then I still am constantly worrying about, you know, if I, because I'm a very, um, because I can very, I fall in love with material. It's like having, being dependent on something that's very hard to come by. And so then I always worry, I'm not going to fall in love again. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to find something I love as much as I'm going to I'm not going to, and so, um, you know, I've gone into the television business because it op opened the door for me to, to love more things. Mm. Um, because that's always a worry is like, what if I don't find something else that I love? And I'm starting to find those things in television, but in film particularly with Hunger Games being such a very gratifying thing, I keep worrying, well, how will I ever find something that I love that much? All right, well, on the, on the note of keep falling in love forever, um, let's open it up for a few questions. Um, we have some time, so don't be shy. This is your chance. Raise a hand. Anyone? Really? Not you. Should we get? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, it means you did a great job. You, like, <laughs> yep. you covered both bases, but I'd love to know about the. Wait, can you just introduce yourself for a little bit? Oh, Brittany Klein is a documentary filmmaker. So sometimes speaking to the choir, but trying not to. Uh, preaching to the choir. Uh, in general, I love what you said about Israel because I'm an LA based Israeli, and people always assume I'm going to be the first defender of Israel, but I'm, artists in Israel are on the far left, and I happen to be very, very far. So, you know, I'm, I'm mostly critical of the policies we have. So. I love how we put it, it's weird that people forget that you can love a place and still be critical of you know, the government, which is always telling me. Uh, but actually my question is totally different. Um, I did the Federation master class, and I remember actually Neil Moritz talking about how he knows in advance according to the tracking how the movie's gonna do. And I remember it fascinated me, but we moved on to the next thing. I would love to hear from you about that process when you know, they start trickling the tracking and the reviews. How does it technically work? And how do you, what do you really understand from what you did right, wrong? Um, well, tracking is mostly very valuable as a relative measure of where your baseline is when you start. So how much awareness, how much interest in various groups, and then how effective your marketing campaign is in moving the needle from there. And so it's a very helpful way of seeing whether marketing materials, who they're reaching, and if they're building interest in those groups. Um, now, of course, what's very depressing is that sometimes they don't. Um, and yet, um, even when they do, um, I, like with Hunter Games, people kept saying to me, oh my god, I'm tracking. And I'm actually so superstitious that when it's good, I don't believe it. <laughs> um, until it happens, and I don't want to talk about it, and I know people keep trying to get me to guess, to tell me what number do I think, and I won't say what I think. So actually, when it's good, I don't believe. It. But when it's bad, you know, you learn, particularly as a studio executive, when you have a lot of volume, you rarely like recover <laughs> from really bad tracking. That said, it's it, now the people's experience and their tweeting and you know com their social networking of their experience in the theater has such a great impact on what happens once they start seeing it, that the tracking can actually still be off 
Um, if you have no, if you're not getting any traction, you're going to know that that's not likely to change. But you can have a movie that actually really overperforms or underperforms based on how people experience it. So I still think it's a it's a value in evaluating how your campaign is working and adjusting your campaign. Like with Wimpy Kid, we saw early on that we had a lot of boys, but we hadn't gotten as many girls interested. And we were really able, through targeted spots, to we knew girls would like the movie. We just had to get them to know an interest, get them interested. And we were really able, the marketing you know, department was able to move the needle. And we watched girls grow, and then the movie opened to really equal boys and girls um, from a, what would have been very imbalanced without that tool. So it can be very valuable, but it also, um, in the world of social networking, uh, the life takes, it takes on a life of its own once it gets into the theater and people start communicating with each other about it, and for, for better or for worse. But what I, I would love to know is, obviously, most of the films I can think of that you made were huge successes, but if there's one that didn't, like, what is your thought process about what went wrong, what would you have changed? Um, well, I'm not generally a believer in blaming marketing for when movies don't work. I mean, I, I said, uh, I had lunch today with somebody I really respect and admire, Chris Melodondry, whose company Illumination does, you know, things like Despicable Me and Lorax. And, I think he's just really smart and really good at what he does. And we were talking about the ways in which actually um, the new media is much better at understanding their consumers and much better at reaching and maintaining a dialogue with their consumers, whether it's video games who have an ongoing form of communication with the people who are using the video games. And so they know their consumers so much better than we do, and we really haven't made use of data properly yet in the movie business in a way that has changed as much as the data has changed. Tracking today is not nearly as different from tracking 10 years ago as it should be based on how much the marketplace and social media has changed and our ability to know and communicate with your consumers. But what I said to him is like, honestly, like, have you ever had something that was great that didn't work? And like when you know when you've made something that works, when you get people gathered around the fire and you have a great story to tell, I honestly I've not seen those things not work. Sometimes you get lucky and with a really good campaign you can get something that's not that great to work. But things that are great generally I it's hard to mess up something that's great. Sometimes, rarely that happens, and you just have a, but usually it's because I think if people, if you lie to the audience about what the movie's about, they hate that, they really they always see through it, they hate that, they get mad at you. But again, why would you lie if you have something great? You're only lying when you don't. And so I think, for me, I don't really blame me marketing. I always just blame myself. <laughs> That's I think. Um, some decision that I made along the way, because that was a wrong decision. Um, wrong director matched with the material, might be, Good director, good material, wrong matchup. Um, uh, blindness to a material's weakness based on your own love. You know, love is blind. You fall in love with things. You don't see what is weak about it. You are following your own passion for it. You don't see where its weaknesses are. Um, and or just movies. They want movies want to be bad. They just have a. They want. To, they want to go wrong and they want to be bad. And then it's a constant correcting to get them not to be bad. And sometimes they succeed and they just aren't good enough. They're not good enough to break through. And especially now, where a movie has to demand communal viewing, it has to be better to see it in the dark with strangers than alone on your couch because there's lots of great things you can watch alone on your couch. And so whether a movie demanded communal viewing is a big question because now it used to be that even if it sort of did, um, you could make up in home video what you didn't capture in the theater. Now you don't really have that stream as like a cushion to break your fall. You fall, you fall hard. Um, it used to be that you had this sort of helium or light layer of helium that was always sort of holding you up from complete disaster. Um, if you had something that was well told that wasn't 
incredibly successful in the theater, it would still catch up with itself on home video. And now with a digital download being so much less than cell through in terms of revenues, it's just as much. Um, I'm curious. Introduce yourself. Mitch Waxman, uh, writer, independent producer. Um, I am curious. Um, that maybe this is uh, an erroneous assumption. I, I interned when I lived in New York for Christine Bashan and Pam Koffler. It seems like a lot of Brown alumni who went the semiotics route have gone on to become really successful producers. Um, I know Brad Simpson is also who works with you is also a Brown alum. Um, what about that educational background do you think formed your sort of skill set that you know that made you a successful producer and others like you? Um, I think it, it, it may vary. I think honestly all of us really love movies. You know, I still, I go to the movies and I am just so excited and happy to be sitting in a movie theater and like popcorn. Like that just makes, I just really love movies. What's been and your favorite like one or two movies that you've seen? The not too distant past. Um, I really I loved Life of Pi, and I thought that was an incredible night of movies. It's just a feeling of really a movie that demanded to be seen in the theater. I thought that was an incredible accomplishment. I loved Django, <laughs> really loved Django. Um, you know, I had a great time with Argo. I mean, I love to say that immersive experience where the time just disappears and you're just completely captivated. Um, but um, I, um, I I tend to like more movies than I don't. I'm much more forgiving of other people's movies. I'm very hard on them that I work on, but I tend to like other people's movies often. Even if I don't love it, I'll... You'll find what's good about it. Yeah, I'll enjoy my time in the theater. Um, but... Um, it's interesting, though, his question, because I also studied film and theory and things like that, and sometimes it kind of ruins it for you because you start reading film on a whole different level that you're not able to kind of just go in and kind of stupidly enjoy it in the same way. So it took some time to kind of decompress from that experience. Well, I think if you look at the people who do it, who went to a ground, like if you were to say what is a common thread, they're all really gonzo about movies. They really, I mean, look at like Tom Rothman's like a great example of that, of somebody who just, you know, really loves movies and um, is so, and so I do think that that's a common thread and um, that, um, and that a desire to like look under the hood and understand what, what makes them tick and what makes them run and, um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's mostly about like a, a love of just loving them and having watched them, and that you, there was just a lot of passion that ran through that department for the movies we were watching, and um, also not just being we didn't all just grow up on Hollywood movies. We watched a lot of your independent movie, and a lot of French movies, and a lot of movies that were not just the kind of classic Hollywood movies. And so then to come to Hollywood movies from having seen much more austere movies, and then also... Right, they're, they're super I mean, there fun a, after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was a point where it felt like movies had usurped the novel, and I think, you know, we felt like we lost that for a while, and I don't know, what is your sort of sense of where movies are headed? Do you think they're, that's coming back? It's interesting to see. I mean, Hunger Games is, clearly has a commentary to make about society and so on, and, Clearly, with Christine and Pam's movies, they have a very political sort of orientation. With movies, but, um. I don't know. I mean, I think in many respects, right now, um, television mm -hmm. is the place that it's interesting. I think right now, television is the place that's demanding communal, is creating communal experience. Right. I think that, like, people are much more. I mean, likely you you have to like hide your head under a rock if you miss an episode of one of your favorite shows. The that like, happened to be with Game of Thrones oh, the other so night. So I got cool. like an email blast the next day and I saw Game of Thrones and I like, couldn't watch it Sunday night. And I was like, no, and I had to delete it right away. No, it's like, well, it's like, I mean, that experience, I mean, I actually think yeah. ultimately, you know, I believe that forces movies to be as, as smart 
be as character driven, be as voice driven as all of that great television that's being made right now is. But I think right now, in many respects, movies, there's such a pursuit of the blockbuster right now. And I love those movies, but there's a feeling that the more meaty material is being, uh, those stories are being told in television, and that movies are popcorn, but not as much, you know, challenge, uh, to challenge your ideas. I mean, every now and again you get lucky with something like a Hunger Games, which I hope does both things, but that's a really rare thing. Um, I think there's great storytelling that happens in a lot of the blockbusters, but I think that television right now is, it's the thing that is commanding communal attention, and I, I, I find that to be interesting. I feel like that's where the conversation is going right now. Um, okay, maybe one or, one or two more. Go ahead. Um, Introduce yourself. Um, Colby Devitt, I have a social media marketing agency, and I want to go back to Hunger Games. How much do you think that the original buildup of the um, audience and social networks for the books of Hunger Games influenced the movie? Because you're thinking about sort of TV having a kind of uh, an experience. You, you sort of had a, a, a book series kind of building that up. Um, in advance of the movie, and, and, and in my understanding, you would know better than me, is that a lot of that book audience was girls before it was boys, and then you're saying the movie's boys and then you turn it back to girls, or you included, you would cover the girls back into it? Well, that was Wimpy that had the boys more than girls. The what? Wimpy Kid was the one that had the boys. Oh, okay, okay. So, but, so, so how much do you think that the book audience on social for Hunger Games influenced and fed into the movie? Oh, I think the book audience was a huge part of it, a huge part of it, because they were having that communal experience of loving a book, wanting to talk about it, getting super excited about the fact that the movie was going to come out, being really like, engaged, who was going to get cast, and you know, wondering if we were going to screw it up, and whether, you know, I think a lot of times people, when you love a book, then the people who make the movie don't love the book as much as you do, and then the movie doesn't respect the thing that you loved about the book, it doesn't capture what you loved about the book, but I think we owe, I mean, we owe a, a huge debt to Suzanne Collins to have the people sitting around the fire, right. and we were able to get in there and, and be a part of her fire, but it was her fire to begin with. Now you start to have this bigger audience of people, now obviously for a movie to do well, even more people have to go see it than love the book. So now you have people who love the book and are interested in the movie, and then you have people who saw the movie and are interested in the series. So now you're sort of speaking to both of them. But the first time around, especially, we were very, very indebted to those fans and how passionate they were. Was, it, was there a significant difference in the, in the characters of the audience? Um, you know, the book actually, it did start out being more girl-driven, but it was one of those few books that was I mean, like my kids, my son loved the book. His friends loved the book. Mm -hmm. And so girls tend to have more time for reading because boys are busy doing video games. And, you know, so girls will tend to be more likely to be online talking about a book. Right. Whereas boys will be online talking about how called you. Talking about girls. Or, and girls. <laughs> they have boys and girls, sports, and called you. You know, and so. Um, that you have to really compete for their attention in a way that where girls will tend to congregate a lot about a book that they love. Um, but boys really loved the book too. They just weren't as like moony about who. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you ever get any satisfactory metrics that social actually got bodies into the sphere? The um, I don't know exactly. I'm sure the marketing department has that. I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. I think that they did an extraordinary yeah, job. It's an amazing campaign. I think That's they, oh, and then innovate, it was actually part of why I chose Lionsgate, is that yeah. I felt that Fantastic. they were very innovative because they don't just throw money at their campaign and at television the way that a big studio can. Right. They are much more likely to right. do innovative, surprising things, and they found ways to create interesting sort of auxiliary conversations in a way that, you know, it's not so linear. It's not just about like, 
here's my movie, let me bang you over the head about it, but here's actually like a stream that like crosses this movie. Does right. it just it's not the it same seems like river. a marquee, it seems like a stellar example of that yeah. for social. So I'm wondering if that stellar amazing example of this amazing movie actually resulted in satisfactory from an executive level metrics where you could measure you know, bodies in the I, I haven't seen that, but I would be really surprised if that isn't true and if there isn't data to support it. But when you sort of end up on my side, you're like, I just kind of like, I just went straight from that movie into worrying about, yeah, I'm being happy. And then literally, it was like immediately had, well, right after the movie opened, the director of the first one decided he wasn't doing the rest of them, and I was like frantically working on getting the second movie. So the kind of understanding it uh, from a marketing perspective and data, I never had the time to delve into that, but I would be really surprised if they didn't move a lot of interest with that campaign. It was over really interesting. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think we have time for one more question, two if they're quick. Okay, so you go first. Hi, I'm Susan Iswood, freelance television producer, assistant director. I, um, I love that you brought up television towards the end. It's all it's been the only medium for me. I just love being in the with the audience um, and the ability to continue telling stories over time. My question for you is, as you mentioned, you're looking at television or looking to move into television. Um, as someone who's more of the director of producers in the what kind of risks do you see yourself as a producer having to take with so much of the power, if you will, being placed in the writing I mean, that's something I'm very, I, my relationships have always largely been with writers that say going, the thing I always have been most connected to is the, the script and is the writing and so a world in which those writers have the power, um, you know, that actually is very appealing to me um, and the fact that television is so voice driven, um, I don't, see myself as a producer who has a specific imprimatur that's like my style or my voice. I'm much more interested in finding somebody else's voice and making sure that that person is sort of able to realize a movie to the best of their ability and if there are things that I can do to shape that and make it better or to make it more true, then that's my job, but I don't, it's not like there's a stamp. I admire Jerry Bruckheimer enormously of having like a stamp in his movies, a style that's his, but I don't think of myself as having that. I'm much more about finding somebody else who has a great style or sensibility and then hopefully being able to be able to nurture or support that. Okay, last question. Do you want to do it in the back? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Schoenfeld. I am an assistant to uh, another producer. Um, what's the biggest challenge you face uh, while making maybe as a studio executive or as a producer? Um, well, I think that I mean, I think one of the hardest things is if, if one of the pieces that's in place isn't right, and you realize that early on, it's very hard to change course. It's very, unless you're going to do something radical, which usually doesn't work out either. So it's when you are, it's, I mean, as far as a challenge, there's the feeling of, if you feel like something's not going right, trying to change course without derailing it. I find that to be a very, very hard thing, especially as a studio executive, a very, very hard thing as a producer, at least you're there day you're more able to guide and shape. Um, but as far as a challenge, I mean, for me, the challenge of getting catching fire up off the ground when we were moving along a plan in which the filmmaker from the first movie that I was very invested in was going to do all of them and then change his mind. And we had literally four months before the start of photography, not a script and not a director. Um, that was a pretty big challenge. Um, but it was actually kind of great. Like, I felt like this is what a producer does. Like, this is actually exactly what I'm supposed to do, is I know that I love these books and I know what I'm supposed to do, and now I just have to go do it. But 
say the challenge in the larger scheme, I think, is like say that there's a momentum that gets going and trying to be able to move and change when you see things that aren't what you feel they ought to be can be very, very hard because a movie with a, a movie with no voice is like the worst thing. And so you can't just bombard the the storyteller with competing voices. You actually have to get away from that person's voice to sort of find itself again and I find that to be a challenge as well. So let's give Nina a round of applause.